Lost Media Urban Legends. Sounds like a lot, huh? With it finally being October, and with this being a pretty spooky day, Friday the 13th and all, I thought I'd go ahead and take the liberty of making a video of that slightly spooky, but not quite. Because, yes, I have seen that one meme where it's like true crime YouTubers uh, talking about true crime and lost media YouTubers talking about Spongebob lost episode. You know, the meme is on the screen. But, yeah, to break away from that stereotype, it's not gonna be like super duper dark or anything. This is just something to get you in the mood for the spooky season. So, with that being said, sit back, relax, grab a snack, maybe get some candy, comment below what you plan to be for Halloween, drink some water, and get cozy, because today, we're diving into the self-made Lost Media Urban Legends iceberg. Thank you guys so much for watching, and we're gonna dive right into this. Enjoy! Tier 1 Saki Sanabashi slash Go For A Punch one of the most well-known pieces of rumored lost media, Go For A Punch, or better well-known as Saki Sinabashi, is our first entry. Known as the Deep Web Anime, it supposedly depicts a group of young women locked in a bathroom with no windows or doors, contemplating life and trying to find an escape. This would soon evolve into insanity as they all come to terms with the situation at hand, and find the only way out of the room is by leaving this mortal realm, as politely as I can put it. It was first mentioned in a 4chan thread about disturbing stuff seen on the deep web, with the post describing some of the details about the anime. The OP described the anime as 80s-ish in quality, with English subtitles for a Japanese dub, with the dub having young sounding voices. The OP claims that the anime was so traumatic for them that they ended up crying themselves to sleep that night. At the end of the post, the OP says that the anime was called something along the lines of go for a punch and that they had never seen it again. This is kind of where I get lost since people started calling the anime Saki Sanabashi somewhere along that way, despite the fact that the original post never claimed to have called it that. In fact, it's, it's nowhere in that thread. Personally, I don't believe this one. I'm not really a big fan of the debate. My main evidence for that argument is that the deep web is accessed through the Tor Onion browser, which runs on many different servers. Running videos on the Tor browser takes forever, and they're extremely low quality, when they do eventually load, at least. Now, I'm not saying that there's no anime out there like this. Heck, there's so much, there's probably at least one that's closely related to this story. However, I'm simply stating that the Go For A Punch anime in the original 4chan post is likely not to exist. Many have come out to say that they're the OP of it, however, there's nothing that can confirm the validity of this, as the 4chan OP was anonymous with their post. There's still a community for people looking for this lost anime, although a lot of their memes have been abandoned or overrun by memes. I'm sure you can still find groups of individuals who still hold out hope for that anime that's truly out there, though. I was a Teenage Gary transformation scene. This one's a classic. This iceberg originally had a bunch of Spongebob stuff on here, but then I came to my senses and reaffirmed the whole urban legend aspect of this video. Spongebob's first season is a classic, and this Halloween episode of the series is no different. I was a teenage Gary follows Spongebob after he trusts Squidward to watch Gary while he's gone. Spoilers for Spongebob, probably, by the way. I probably should have clarified that at the beginning. Anyways, Spongebob gets back. Squidward turns out to be not good at this, and Gary has to see a vet who tells them to inject Gary with snail plasma. Squidward accidentally injects Spongebob with the plasma, turning him into a snail, and later, the same thing happens to Squidward. The screen then transitions to Snail Word and Snail Bob outside in the moonlight, and the episode wraps up. The screen transition, however, was the cause of discussion. Usually in Spongebob, there's a bubble transition. Say, scene one is going on, then bubbles rise up on the screen, and then we're in scene two. Well, in this episode, there's no bubble transition, just a screen wipe, which happens directly after Squidward gets injured. Rumors started online that there was a removed scene that depicts Squidward transforming into Snail Word. Rumors stated that this scene was removed due to it being too disturbing for first-time viewers, as well as it was simply removed from... Uh, runtime, mainly. Uh, many argued that this scene did air, with some saying that the Polish dub of the episode still had the scene in it. However, that was debunked. Then people said that it aired on the very first debut of the episode. But someone actually had a VHS and released it online, disproving that theory. It really wasn't until showrunner Vincent Waller tweeted about this case, debunking all the claims to the fact that it was never even storyboarded. Just a classic case of misremembering and the Mandela effect. A Day with Spongebob Squarepants This is the lost media of all time. It all started with this Amazon listing for a film called A Day with Spongebob Squarepants. 
This movie, set to release in 2011, was never available for purchase. The cover of the movie, despite no release, features three reviews for three separate sources praising the movie. The production description reads, in this mockumentary, Spongebob lives above ground like all Hollywood superstars. Afraid that Spongebob is becoming old news, his boss runs a contest called A Day with Spongebob. The contest makes Spongebob the talk of the town as thousands of kids enter to win. The lucky winner is Seth, and he's ecstatic about his day with Spongebob. However, the day becomes a roller coaster ride as things don't go quite the way they planned. And so naturally you can assume that this stock footage kid is Seth. And yeah, that's stock footage. From what has been said by someone behind the development of the film, the cover featured on the listing was to pitch more people to get involved with the project. However, it was canceled and there was no actual film. Regal Films, the company behind this film, released five pages of a script and announced they'd finish it via crowdfunding. However, this hasn't happened. If you're interested in learning the whole scope of the search, Blame It On Jorge has a really good video on it, as well as some stuff by Bedhead Bernie. Those videos do more justice to the search than I can and talk more in depth about the people involved and how deep the rabbit hole actually gets. Walt Disney's Birthday Gift This one is a classic story and you've probably heard it before. 1936 welcomed Walt Disney's 35th birthday. And what better way to welcome that than throwing the man a company party? The party was organized by Roy Disney, Walt's brother, and got a big portion of the staff in on it. A cartoon was produced by two animators that was shown off at the party to surprise Disney. The short animation featured Mickey and Minnie Mouse in an act of procreation. This got quite the response out of Disney, who immediately laughed, asked for the names of the two individuals who animated, and then promptly fired them on the spot. He proceeded to ask everyone to destroy any copies of the animation. What a birthday wish! I imagine the party would have been awkward after that, if it even happened. The very first account of this event comes from the book Walt Disney, Hollywood's Dark Prince, a biography written by Mark Elliott in 1994. This biography has come under controversy as it mainly has various pieces of conflicting information. Heck, some of it has even been debunked, so it's not really sure if this actually happened or not. While the event has been mentioned a few more times, it cannot be verified if this actually happened or not. If Disney successfully destroyed every copy of this animation, then there's no more proof it existed than if it didn't. There may have been an off chance that if it is real, an employee may have kept it. However, if my manager responded so strongly to something like that, I'd just do what I was told and not risk my job with that as well. What a birthday gift. Getting to see your creations doing that. Lovely, isn't it? Super Mario FX Super Mario FX is more of a video game urban legend, however a portion of that transfers over to Lost Media, so I thought I'd discuss it anyways. In 1993, Nintendo released Star Fox for the Super Nintendo Entertainment System. The game utilizes the SNES's Super FX chip, which allowed the game to create a perspective of 3D gameplay. As mentioned in a Nintendo Power Magazine interview, Shigeru Miyamoto mentions that the power of the FX chip during the production of Star Fox is what inspired him to develop a 3D Mario game. Miyamoto's idea coming up during the production of Star Fox led many to believe that he began development for a 3D Mario game during this time, with the intention of using the Super FX chip to run this game. However, nothing ever came of these rumors, and it would be three years later in 1996 that Mario's first 3D game would release, Super Mario 64. And yeah, there's a million things about the development of this game, but nothing about the game being developed on the Super Nintendo. I mean, the Nintendo 64 was literally made to run the new world of 3D games. Uh, this was debunked when Dylan Cuthbert, a developer for Star Fox and the FX chip, confirmed that there was no Mario game developed that utilized the full capabilities of the Super FX chip. Uh, Mario 64 was first shown off in 1995, a good two years after Star Fox released. It's generally agreed that the rumors of this lost Mario game began because of misinterpretations of the Nintendo Power interview, and I agree as well. I do like the idea of a lost Mario game for the SNES though, what a search that would be. Hiro Gata. Every two seconds, a man dies on Earth. That's the text that ran across the screen of one anonymous 2chan user's TV after witnessing a disturbing advertisement slash PSA that the internet has since dubbed Hiro Gata. In 2004, an anonymous user posted their experience with a creepy ad they saw on a two-channel thread about creepy commercials and advertisements. One anonymous post details one that they had witnessed involving two flashing white humanoid figures while a noise played in the background. In sync with this noise, 
one figure would fade, and the other would disappear, and then vice versa. This unknown commercial was dubbed Hitogata by the community surrounding it due to the white figures or dolls. This search is similar to Go For A Punch in the same way as this being posted anonymously under a thread about creepy media. However, this search holds a little more legitimacy than Saki. You see, the most cited post about Hitogata on 2 Channel wasn't the first, as in 1999 there was a mention of a similar commercial. While people may argue that this is just some creepypasta or fake urban legend, there's been a dedicated team of searchers looking into any of all mentions online of Hitogata. They've even compiled a spreadsheet noting the air times and locations of reported sightings. A few recreations have been made online, but no actual confirmed video or footage of the commercial. In 2023, Lost Media YouTuber Blame It On Jorge uploaded an analysis video on Hirogata, and since that video, more and more ads have been found that nearly match the description for Hirogata. It's also pretty crazy how many ads have blinking white figures in them. Small world, huh? Crackmaster. In the mid to late 2000s, mentions online of a lost Sesame Street short began to become more relevant, as people began to talk more and more about how terrifying this short was. The short, originating from the earlier seasons of Sesame Street, featured a terrifying monster that lived within the cracks of a young girl's wall. The community would dub this strange Sesame Street urban legend as just Cracks. Cracks had one of the weirdest searches among Sesame Street Lost Media, as every source who provided a copy of the short chose to remain anonymous. The short was first provided to John Armand, who posted about it online. However, Armand was not allowed to release this short to anyone online. The search exploded after this. Why would an anonymous source send Armand a copy of it, especially out of this generosity, and remain silent? A lot of contacts were made during the search, and a lot of the responses that the search team received were extremely dodgy. It wasn't until December of 2013 that Lost Media Wiki founder Diecake was sent a copy of the short by yet another anonymous user. The short was found, but to end the search on one last bit of mysteriousness, the anonymous user provided Diecake with a complete copy, almost a direct source, versus the one Armin received that was ripped from an episode of Sesame Street. The short is as eerie as everyone claimed, to be fair. It begins with a girl lying in bed looking at cracks on the wall, and she begins to meet all sorts of creatures that live in the cracks. She meets Crack Camel, Crack Hen, and Crack Monkey. The four of them travel to meet the Crack Master, who destroys himself out of his own negativity. Yeah, this short was super weird, and this had strange music in the background while a woman narrated what was happening. Crack Master has since been released onto YouTube, where it can easily be found. Clockman. Clockman was a lost urban legend later confirmed to be real that began in early 2012 on Bungie.net's off-topic forums. Yeah, like Halo and Destiny Bungie. The original post by user Commander Santa stated that they were looking for an animated short that terrified them as a child. They recounted seeing the short on Nickelodeon's Pinwheel, a puppet show that was geared towards younger children that ran for 5 seasons and 260 episodes. Commander Santa recounts that the clock man would come out of a clock and abduct a child, making them go through a wild experience and then returning them home. Many users suggested different pieces of media that might have been, however most of them were ruled out. This was until someone came across an AnimationNation.com forum thread discussing weird cartoons from childhood. User Michael W. Howe mentions on March 6, 2004 that they had seen some scary stuff on Pinwheel, and one story about a little girl who experiences something similar to what Commander Santa mentions in his original recounting of the story. Michael's post tells the story of a girl who loses her red shoes and asks a wizard to make new ones. The wizard does, but only on the condition that she tells her mother. The girl doesn't in hopes that the wizard would forget. The most important part of this post, in my opinion at least, is where Michael mentions the narrator saying, The wizard did not forget. The whole search was just kind of considered an urban legend for the longest time. Nobody know who made it, even when it was made, or heck, the name of it. People were just calling it Clockman due to how elusive it was. The only real information were the accounts of it online and that it came from Pinwheel. In late 2017, LMW Forums user Nitrate Nerd came across a video simply titled Sally. Upon looking into the short film titled O Paradive Sally was a solid match to Clockman, and a few days later, Commander Santa would confirm that this was Clockman. O Paradive Sally was produced in 1976 by Triple A Studios, before the short would be featured on Pinwheel. A little girl is given a brand new pair of gloves by her mother and is told not to lose them. 
but she does. She seeks out the help of the wizard to make her new ones, and after the wizard agrees, he informs her that he must tell her mother what happened. She doesn't, and hopes he'll forget, but the wizard did not forget, and brings her on a wild ride all throughout the night, and when she wakes up, she tells her mother exactly what happens. This is a bit of a spin on the old fairy tale of the red shoes, where a girl is given a brand new pair of red shoes, disobeys the mother, and pays the price, but that one's a lot darker. Nonetheless, this lost meteor urban legend was found. Evil Farming Game On April 30th, 2016, Reddit user u slash Sparta213 posted to the tip of my joystick subreddit, a community made to help people find the name of a game based on information they provided, about a farming simulator game similar to Harvest Moon with, quote, a dark twist. The post read, I know almost nothing about this game. All I can remember is that it's kind of like Harvest Moon, but with a dark twist. The game starts out with you and your wife. One night you get into a fight and you end up unaliving her. I'm paraphrasing her. Now the game revolves around you farming to stay alive while trying to keep the town from finding out about the incident that happened. Every now and then the cops come to search your house and you have to hide her corpse. Many different users chimed in to add what was going on, making suggestions and trying to get more details. OP mentioned it coming from the early 2000s, not 3D and not in the browser. The whole subreddit was created and dedicated into the search for this game, the lost and rumored evil farming game. This search lasted for about five years, with many possible leads coming up, but later disregarded. There are a surprising number of evil farming games where you end up doing that. On June 13th, 2021, Reddit user PM Me Your Ears made a post on the Evil Farming Game subreddit with a theory that OP of the first post had confused the whole game from a Vine Sauce Joel video. The post contained a clip from Joel's stream in which he talks about an evil farming game, which does not exist. Sparta213 was contacted about this, where they said they used to fall asleep to Joel's videos, thus probably heard this, fell asleep, and subsequently dreamt up this game. Since then, the search has concluded with it all being a dream. There is a project in the works to create a game based on the scenario though, but I couldn't find a release date set for the project. It's on Steam, named the Evil Farming Game Replanted. Funny how a one-off joke created a chain of events that lasted for five years. Tier 2 Polybius this is a literal classic urban legend, Lost Media or not. Polybius was a rumored arcade game that it would induce feelings of depression, as well as trigger epilepsy in its players. The arcade game was a really big concern for many players, as people would always be sick after playing the game. Or occasionally, men in suits would come and take data from the machine, and then disappear. This would happen frequently until some men came to all the arcades it was present at, loaded up the arcade cabinet, and took the game away, never to be seen again. That's a bit of a simplified understanding of the legend, but boy is it classic. The game was allegedly only around in Portland, Oregon in the 80s. It was highly addictive and would cause physical and psychoactive effects on players. Supposedly developed in 1981 by company Sinistroshan Inc., the game was only around in arcades for a month before mysterious men in black would take the arcade cabinet away. Sinistroshan roughly translates to the mind eraser in Swedish and mind erasing in German. Many people who claim to have witnessed the strange anomalies of this game claim that it was all a part of the MK Ultra operation run by the Central Intelligence Agency. Of course, a lot of uh, MK Ultra has come out to the public over the years, including the time the CIA gave an elephant LSD and caused its subsequent death, but nothing about a video game with psychoactive properties. Everyone knows the old story of Polybius. It's fake, but it was fun. Heck, the name is actually derived from the Creek historian of the same name, who insisted that his fellow colleagues never believe what is said based solely on eyewitness accounts. Basically, you gotta have proof, and that's something that Polybius, the game, never had. The original Thunderbird photo. I'm a big cryptid fan. Heck, I even thought about starting a cryptid analysis series on this channel, but when it comes and it crosses lost media, that's just a big ol' chef's kiss. The Thunderbird is a creature of Native American legend and mythology. Many different native peoples have their own version of the Thunderbird, however, the general description of the creature is all the same. A large bird with massive wingspan and huge talons that could abduct a person in seconds. The wings flapping would sound like literal thunders of the people below, and in some accounts, could create lightning with the blink of its eyes. On April 26, 1890, a newspaper in Tombstone, Arizona posted a picture of six men holding out their biggest hunt ever. 
they were displaying some sort of massive wind creature almost resembling a pterodactyl that was bigger than a person. The men had apparently shot the creature and legend spread throughout the town, as many recalled seeing this picture in magazines and so on. Problem is, no one can confirm that this picture of it is even true. Archives of the newspaper from the day this allegedly happened shows no image in the newspaper, and no magazines have been found that have the original in it. And while there have been various recreations, they're not the original. An article by KGUN9 states that sometime in the 1930s or so, one of the hunters of the story came forward and said that they were never able to catch it, and the story spiraled out of control. So it makes you wonder though, why do so many people remember seeing this image of a Thunderbird? Shazam with Sinbad Another, and arguably the most popular, case of misremembering media, Shazam with Sinbad is like the poster boy of the Mandela Effect. Also, I'm writing the script now, and I swear that there were only like two A's in Shazam, not three. I already made the iceberg image, though, so I'm, I'm not going to change it. Spooky Mandela Effect. But what is the Mandela Effect? Well, if you're not familiar, allow me to sum it up. The Mandela Effect is a phenomenon of mass misremembering, like how tons of people remember Nelson Mandela dying in prison when he actually didn't. Many people remember a movie in the 90s about two kids who find a genie lamp in their attic and inside is Sinbad playing Shazam the genie. But this movie doesn't exist. Instead, in our timeline, we get Kazam starring Shaq. Believers in the Mandela Effect theory believe that an alternate timeline or universe may emerge with ours, thus changing small details in our universe, like how Fruit Loops is spelt and how Pikachu's tail actually doesn't have like a tip or whatever. Who knows, maybe it's temporal contamination from time travelers, but nope, just people misremembering a movie about Shaq and mistaking it for Sinbad. Also, in 2017, April Fool's Day, College Humor made a video parroting this with Sinbad, so that's pretty neat. Silent Hill Exotica Silent Hill Exotica was a lost, modded version of Grand Theft Auto Vice City for the original Xbox that turned the game into a horror experience resembling Silent Hill. This mod was actually quite impressive, adding in all sorts of Silent Hill entries to the game. Uh, Vice City, now coated in thick fog, is filled with various creatures that would very much not like you to be there. The mod was actually created sometime in 2016, and various screenshots and images were posted online. The mod was available online for a short while, however all archive.org links associated with it had stopped working, and proper archival of the mod was not achieved. For the longest time, this mod was considered just a myth in the GTA community, it wasn't until 2023 when the mod in its entirety was recovered and made available once again. It was recovered by Reddit user u slash mystic underscore channel after they had bought a modded Xbox and the lost mod had been loaded into it. Thus, the mod was made available online once again. And I've gotta say, this mod is actually really good quality for something that was only for the original Xbox. Given it's still GTA Vice City, the graphics aren't mind-boggling, but they still definitely fit the vibe of this mod. I would love to play this mod sometime, so it makes me beyond happy that the rumored Silent Hill GTA game has been found. Lost FNAF Trailer Five Nights at Freddy's is one of the most popular horror series of this year, with nine main games in the series not counting Ultimate Custom Night, tons of books, and even a movie slated for 2023. Now, admittedly, I'm horrible at FNAF. I've only beaten the Pizzeria Simulator in FNAF 3, but I'm almost done with Night 4 of the first game. The series was developed by Scott Cawthon, an indie game developer looking to create something new. And when it came time to release the first game, Scott would promote the series on his YouTube channel. Alongside the original trailer, there was a rumored video that was once uploaded to Scott Cawthon's YouTube channel to promote the game, however, it was taken down shortly after. This lost trailer for the game featured a picture of an endoskeleton that was supposed to be in the trailer. It was wearing Freddy's suit, but had no mascot head, and the eyes were replaced with red ones. Claims of this trailer came from a user named Wallmeat, who swore that the trailer that featured this different endoskeleton was deleted. To add on to the suspicions of a lost trailer, Reddit user u slash the Freddy channel dug through the internet archive to try to find proof of this trailer maybe existing through an archived link. What they found instead was a link to an old Google Plus account belonging to Scott Cawthon, where it was discovered that Scott had three deleted videos. Out of the three, only one was unable to be re-uploaded, a video simply titled Five Nights. Five Nights remains lost, however, as for the lost trailer, Wallmeat would confirm on Twitter that they had simply misremembered the original trailer. While the rumor lasted from 2014 to 2020, the search and interest didn't really take off until the very last year. Still fun though. Dracula 1920 this is a rumor of a Russian film adaptation of Bram Stoker's novel, Dracula. Now, obviously, Dracula has found his way into various pieces of pop culture and media, but this supposed film would have been the very first film adaptation of the story. 
It's mentioned in the Vampire Book, The Encyclopedia of the Undead by J. Gordon Melton, a book that compiles a bunch of vampire lore, in which Melton claims that the film was a 1920 film from Russia and that no copies have survived. It's mentioned again in an updated version of the book, which claims that it may have been a silent film in Russia. There's all sorts of conflicting information and theories about this film, such as Viktor Torjansky being the director of the film, however, it isn't mentioned in his filmography. Another theory behind the existence, or rather unexistence, of this film is that it was possibly destroyed in the Russian Civil War, given the timeline of the movie's production. Some claims have stated that the film starred Ukrainian actors, and some claims don't even mention the actors, just the director. There's a slight chance that this could all be a huge case of misremembering something as well, as it could just be refused with Dracula's Death, a Hungarian film from 1921, also a silent film, and also lost. As for Dracula 1920, however, I've seen claims that Russian users have debunked this, but I can't find any sources for those claims. Knights of the Werewolf Knights of the Werewolf was a Spanish-slash-French film from 1968, directed by René Govar. The film follows a professor who accidentally turns his student into a werewolf and uses his werewolf student to exact revenge on those who have wronged him. There's a lot of speculation to the existence of this film, specifically on if it was even filmed in the first place. Paul Nashi, the one who played the werewolf, claimed that the film had been filmed in Paris. The film was with director René Govar until Govar's death before the film was supposed to be processed. This claim is extremely messy though, as some say that the film was destroyed in the crash because he was actually going to go get the film processed, others say that the film was never actually processed due to nobody paying for it. You would think that someone of Govar's family would have followed through on this, right? Well, there's speculation that he didn't even exist, as there's no record of someone of that name being in the film industry, leading some to believe that Nashi made up the whole thing. So what evidence is there to aid in the argument for its existence? This single picture that was featured in a documentary documented to Nashi titled The Man Who Saw Frankenstein Cry, claiming that this picture came from that film, meaning that it could have been processed, but if not, in the scenario it's real, it proves that the film was at least filmed or considered, as he was completely in costume for this picture. Deep Star 4000 Fish Recording the Deep Star 4000 was a deep sea vessel built in 1965 and used until 1972 for hundreds of deep sea dives. The vessel was able to take a crew down to the depth of 1,200 meters below the sea level. During a dive in 1966, the crew aboard the vessel claimed that they had seen a large fish over 40 feet in length swim by. The crew was piloted by Joe Thompson and marine biologist Jean LaFont. They were on a deep dive to around 4,000 feet and when Thompson looked out the window of the vessel, he saw a giant eye which swam past and briefly got the glimpse of a large fish. This sighting was kept quiet before being described to journalists, which attracted the attention of the cryptozoology community. While Thompson and LaFond were unable to capture any photographic or video proof, there's allegedly audio from the vessel that captures the reaction of the men. There's been a lot of debate about what this creature was, however the cryptid uh, community has dubbed this the Deep Star 4000 fish. There's no mention of where this audio went, if it still exists or not, which would aid in proving the existence of this massive creature. Heck, we haven't even explored the entirety of the ocean yet, so there could be things lurking out there that we would not want to know about. So really, it, it does kind of, it's, it's more realistic than, say, the Thunderbird, you know? Tier 3. Kurt Cobain's Ren and Stimpy Song. Kurt Cobain was the co-founder of the rock band Nirvana. He was their lead vocalist and guitarist, as well as a songwriter for the band. There was a rumor by Billy West, the voice actor for Stimpy, that Kurt Cobain had approached Spumco Animation sometime in 1990, wanting to write a theme song for the show. He apparently wrote a song and recorded it, however the showrunners for the series didn't like it and threw it away. Billy West had claimed on the Nerdist podcast at the time, Cobain was just a kid who wanted to write something and they were unaware of who he was at the time. The podcast interview with Billy West was the only reinforcing evidence of this existing, as the creator of Ren and Stimpy was unaware of this rumor. This rumor was later debunked on Twitter by Billy West, clarifying in a tweet that Cobain did indeed want to do music for the series, but it never came to fruition, meaning that nothing was ever recorded for the series by Cobain. Pygmalion, original ending, King of the Hill. King of the Hill was a popular adult animation series created by Mike Judge that aired for 13 seasons, ending in 2009. The show has had a plethora of odd episodes as the show follows Hank Hill trying his best to understand the modern generation. 
Rarely did King of the Hill tackle horror, however, when it eventually did, it did not disappoint. Season 7, Episode 9, titled Pygmalion, follows Luann as she falls in love with a mentally ill man who wants to shape her into something she isn't. That's the simplified understanding of it, but basically Trip Larson, the owner of Larson's Pork Products, wants to live out a fantasy where Luann is the woman featured in the Larson Pork Products advertisement, and he wants to be the pig. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really sure how to add much more context to that. He goes crazy and chases her, and the chase ends with them in the slaughterhouse, where Trip's life ends. There is a rumor of an extended ending upon broadcast that showed Trip's lifeless body hanging from a meat hook. However, after the episode's original broadcast was found, these rumors were debunked. SpongeBob Brazilian Defecation Broadcast Okay, so my YouTube friends uh, told me to put this on here, so I, I guess I have to. Uh, a brown note is a theoretical frequency that, when heard, will cause the human body to evacuate itself. Uh, the rumor goes that in an episode of Spongebob, specifically uh, Band Geeks, there was a brown note that played during the Brazilian broadcast. That's it. That's all you need to know. There's nothing else to add. So, you know, thanks to all of my, uh, my fellow Lost Video friends that uh, told me to put this on the iceberg. This is to you guys. Username 666 Videos Username 666 is a classic creepypasta about a YouTube channel that would corrupt your computer and force you to watch videos that were disturbing and gross. Going to the channel, you would refresh the page until your internet devolves into a hellish display of strange content where your, your computer becomes so infected that you can't even turn it off. There were rumors of videos online that accompanied the creepypasta. Now, normally this uh, pasta has a video of someone visiting the website, but these rumors were all about videos that were actually on the channel, like the channel's actual content. Obviously, this is just a creepypasta, but for the time that people did believe that there was a channel of that name, it felt real. You used to be able to go to the channel and see that it was no longer available, kind of like the pasta was real, but ever since they implemented tags on YouTube, it redirects to a legitimate channel. It's the end of an era. Bill Cosby Wet Dreams PSA. Let's see if I can discuss this in the most family-friendly way possible. So, Bill Cosby used to do a bunch of educational PSAs, and a Reddit post on the Lost Media subreddit described a PSA they were seeing as a kid about Bill Cosby talking about specific dreams endorsed by hormones to the younger generations. There's no proof of this PSA existing, and for a short time, there was a search dedicated to this. After searching filmography for Cosby, there were no mentions of this PSA, and it's unsure if this was something that was even shown in schools, or if it was some separate thing that was available online. If it was online, though, it's lost now. I don't have much to say on this one. I feel wrong just talking about it. Lonnie Zamora Photos The Lonnie Zamora UFO case is arguably one of the strangest UFO cases in the U.S., Granted, all UFO cases are strange, but this one was swift, had a quick response from authorities, and had a flurry of mystery surrounding it, especially after declassified documents show that the report filed by federal agents to the public was different from the ones filed privately. In 1964, Lonnie Zamora, a local police officer, witnessed what he described to be an unidentified flying object land in the New Mexican desert. The object was pill-shaped with four legs used to support it and a strange red symbol on the side. Have you guys ever seen those backyard butane tanks? It looks something like that. When the US military began to investigate these claims, they entered it into Project Blue Book, a massive compilation of UFO sightings where it remains one of the 701 unexplained incidents documented. Ted Jordan, one of the investigating police officers from Sorocco County, had been taking photos of nearly everything before the US Air Force arrived, allegedly including pictures of burning foliage, the exact landing spot that was left behind, and imprints of the ship's legs, and even what appeared to be footsteps. Jordan's photos, however, were confiscated by members of the Air Force, which would later claim that this film containing the photos was damaged and thus could not be developed. This would be the only actual proof of the landing site and its strange after effects, as many newspapers and reports make no mentions of the legs of the ship leaving markings in the sand, as well as the alleged glass left behind from the fumes of the ship, which actually disappeared after an overnight investigation. Jordan's pictures have led some to believe that there may have been a form of cover-up, however, the Air Force claimed that the film was damaged by radiation, which could have been the case given the scenario where a literal UFO landed in that vicinity. The only problem with that is that declassified documents to the FBI from the Kirtland Air Force Base claims that there were no traces of radiation in the area. So, 
yeah, if you're interested in looking into the specifics of this case, definitely check out the declassified reports as well as blame it on Jorge's video about the incident. CWC Black Tape Chris Chan is an online personality in Lolcow known for their antics online as well as their criminal record in more recent years. Creator of the online webcomic Sonichu, Chris Chan soon became victim to internet bullying, harassment, and trolling. Quick would only proceed to fuel the flames of the trolls by providing personal information about their life and making it publicly available online, all just to combat mislabelings. On September 6, 2011, Robert Franklin Chandler Jr. passed away due to heart complications, leaving Chris Chan without a father. Robert was 84 years old at the time of his passing, Chris being only 29 years old at Bob's time of passing. Around the time of Bob's passing, Chris had been communicating with a troll who went by the name of Jackie, who was basically catfishing Chris. Jackie would ask Chris to kick their video game addiction and attempt to better mature Chris, but would also do a complete 180 on that to get more content by asking Chris to dress up as different characters and reveal more personal information in new YouTube videos. Something that was commonplace in Chris Dury was the act of recording various phone calls, Skype calls, and so on when talking to Chris. During the Jackie saga, this was no different, however one call has never been released. Dubbed by those involved as the Black Tape, the call that was recorded is regarded as too depressing to get out. The call was a day after Bob's passing, and during the call, Chris breaks down and cries over the passing of Bob. In a thread of the Kiwi Farms in 2013, the call is brought up and Marvin, one of the admins, mentions that he's heard the call and it will not be released due to how sad and unfunny it is. This is speculation, but the way Marvin phrases his message sounds like the tape may still exist, although others say that the tape was deleted, plus that thread was 10 years ago. Until there's any real confirmation of it, however, it will remain an urban legend of lost media. Tier 4 Grand Theft Auto Golf Patch The Grand Theft Auto Golf Patch is a lost media creepypasta for the game Grand Theft Auto San Andreas. The story follows that the mod was posted onto 4chan's V-board and was downloaded by people who came across the thread. Why would you do that? It, it, it's beyond me. Anyways, the people downloading it claimed that the mod had a virus in it, although it could be removed and you could run the game like normal. The mod added in all sorts of new missions, however players noticed that the specifics of these missions were quite strange. One player noted that he played a mission where he had to do a drive-by and take out certain targets, which all of which the minor characters had really strange names. Now, I don't know how many people have played San Andreas, but the only time characters are given full names is when they add to the story, which wasn't the case in this mod. These were just plain in-game targets that had full names. This one player in particular claimed that the targets had the name of his mother, who had been missing since 2010. Upon other players looking into the mod, they all found that the names featured in the mods were in a missing person's database. The story goes on, uh, the discussion of this got so big that eventually the thread was deleted by admins. The creator of the mod claimed that they were given all of the information to create the mod by other anonymous users, including the names and scenarios, and after the discourse surrounding the mod, the creator vanished. There are a few screenshots from 4chan allegedly from this thread in which users talk about the characters and even their discovery of people in the missing person's database. Fun stuff. Q Gospel also known as the Q source, is a hypothetical source for several of the books in the New Testament of Jesus Christ. This hypothesis comes from many theologists who claim that the alleged Q source and the Gospel of Mark explain the many similarities between the Gospel of Luke and the Gospel of Matthew. Throughout both Gospels, there are various quotes from Jesus, some of which are the same quote, but of different variations. There's a lot of theories about why the Q source is linked to Mark, Matthew, and Luke, for example, we have the whole Q source equals discrepancies of Matthew and Luke, which means that Q was another source of the teachings of Christ that provided information that would be present in the two Gospels. Another theory is that the Gospel of Luke was written later than the others and is actually a combination of Q, Mark, and Matthew. Many theologists have been trying to wrap their heads around this hypothetical gospel, however quite a few consider it to be non-canon to the Bible, but I won't be talking about Bible canon because that's way outside of my expertise. Quite a few of the Bible stories are attributed to, to the Q source, if 
it does exist, including the Lord's Prayer, Love Your Enemies, and Judge Not That You Should Be Judged. These are all various stories that exist in both Gospels that have overlapping but varying stories about Christ's teachings. From what I found online, the general consensus is that Luke got all of his Gospel from others, as he was not there to witness the life of Christ, as opposed to Matthew who did. I feel like this leans more into the theory of Q, Matthew, and Mark creating the Gospel of Luke, but that still leaves open the unknown Gospel of Q, and if it had any unique elements to it that weren't featured in the other Gospels. The New Testament is made up of the four Gospels, Matthew, Luke, Mark, and John, as well as the other books. Uh, the theory I find believable, though, is that Mark was the first Gospel written alongside this hypothetical Q source, and thus Matthew and Luke were written from it, thus making Mark, Matthew, and Luke synoptic Gospels. So yeah, hypothetical lost Bible canon. Missing JFK Assassination Evidence John Fitzgerald Kennedy was the 35th President of the United States, serving in office from January 20th, 1961 to November 22nd, 1963. His first term of presidency, and more so his life, was cut short, however, as when visiting Dallas, Texas, Kennedy was assassinated by Lee Harvey Oswald. The assassination has been a topic of conspiracy theories in the interest of many, as even today the assassination is still being discussed. So what's up with missing evidence? In 1976, the House of Representatives Select Committee on Assassinations, or the HSCA, was established to investigate both the assassination of Martin Luther King Jr. and the assassination of John F. Kennedy. The HSCA determined that the cause of the assassination of Kennedy was Lee Harvey Oswald, however, there could have been a second shooter responsible for a fourth gunshot fired, which had missed Kennedy entirely. Basing the evidence off of a Dictabelt recording from Dallas Police Channel 1 and a lost additional film. One man who had witnessed the assassination had recorded it as well, however it's not as well known as the Zapruder film. Known as the Nix film, the film captured the grassy knoll as well as allegedly puffs of smoke coming from that area, potentially gunshots. The film was brought to the FBI on December 1st, 1963 and returned to Mr. Orville Nix three days later. Nix stated in a 1966 interview that he believed that the film he received from the FBI may not have been the original and believed it to have been altered. In 1978, the HSCA investigated the footage, however, it was never returned and the original was completely lost. Using the Nix film and the Dictabelt audio, the HSCA ruled that the assassination was a result of a conspiracy that involved Oswald and a second shooter, and no governments or government agencies were involved. It's rumored that this film may still exist somewhere, and more evidence may as well, as in 2015 it was revealed that the CIA withheld information from the Warren Commission, the other investigating party behind the JFK assassination. It should be noted that the Dictabelt audio has been contested and generally debunked, and the next film was never mentioned by the Warren Committee. You're free to interpret this information as it may. I'm only going off of official reports and public information without trying to dive too much into conspiracy theory territory, so you can draw your own conclusions from that information. Personally, I believe that the full Nix film may no longer exist due to the amount of time that has passed, but there's always a chance that it could have been saved or copied during the investigation. Babushka Lady Photos We have two JFK pieces of lost media back to back. So throughout nearly every picture of of the JFK assassination, you can see a woman wearing a headscarf, usually worn by Russian or Polish women. Dubbed the Babushka Lady by many, she is seen carrying around a camera with her, either filming or taking photos of the presidential motorcade. While she remains to be unidentified, it's believed that her true identity is one Beverly Oliver, who claimed to have recorded the assassination on a Japanese Yashika camera, then proceeded to turn her film over to people who identified as FBI agents. This claim has never been proven, and it has never been proven that she was in Dallas on the day of the assassination. Furthermore, the HSCA and Warren Committee never mentioned any film from Oliver. The Babushka Lady's photos have been the subject of many theories believing that she could have captured another shooter somewhere on her film. I actually visited Dallas a few years ago and went to Dealey Plaza to try to get a perspective on the Babushka Lady's photos, and it was a pretty fun experience. While yes, her photos would hypothetically capture the grassy knoll, if they still exist at least, they were more focused on the presidential motorcade, similar to the Mix film or the Much More film. If these photographs did still exist, the quality of them for investigating the assassination in the current day wouldn't be too good, as time has a way of wearing down old film. Rest assured, we're finished talking about speculative JFK lost media. 4chan Alien Post 
In February of 2017, a 4chan post, and I can't find what board it was on, so sorry about that, was made featuring a picture of a literal alien. Known as the alien selfie incident, the post featured an alien standing in front of the camera with a few cacti growing behind it in the desert. The post simply read, 24489, taken approximately 24 miles northwest of Luke Air Force Base in Phoenix, Arizona, Lab H4C. Quite a few users saw the post until a bunch of cloud fair servers went down, including the one hosting 4chan. When the site came back up, the post of the alien was no longer there. Many recreations of the photo have since been posted online, some claiming to be the original, yet they've been debunked. Many conspiracy theorists believe that the photo was taken down by the government and while the Cloudflare servers were down, they scrubbed any traces of the photograph with mentions of it the next day being removed by moderators. So let's take a look at this because I do want to do my own debunking of this. 2448.9 is likely the date of the picture, albeit using the day, month, year format, which isn't common in America, so why would it be used in Arizona? The 24th of April, 1989. While this does match up with the rumored quality of the photo being extremely bad, it still doesn't explain why they'd bring an alien to the surface to take pictures. It makes literally no sense. Anyways, if there's any alien conspiracy theorists in the comments, please let me know what you think. I want to hear someone defend the legitimacy of this post. If I ever do a video covering the plethora of posts about 4chan aliens, I'll feature a few. Eric Harris Doom Wads. So doom modding is definitely a more recent interest of mine. Yet the specific topic is more interesting in a morbid sense given the additional information and specifically the individual surrounding it. Eric Harris was the creator of these various doom wads that he would frequently play and share with his friends. However, it's rumored that they held a more significant role in what would soon come to pass at the hands of him and his friend Dylan Klebold. On April 20th, 1999, Dylan and Eric would enter a Columbine High School and take the lives of 15 people, injuring many more. Eric had indeed shared many of the Doom Wads with his friends, however, there were rumors that both he and Dylan would practice and plan out their attack using a wad that Eric made of the school. This was a rumored map called RealDoom.Wad that Eric had mentioned a few times that was believed to be the supposed map of the school, however, no copies of Real Doom have surfaced. In the FBI's report of the massacre, it confirms that Eric had a recreation of the school saved, and he would fill the map with enemies using it to plan out what he would do. In the mentions of it, Eric insisted on people asking for it, meaning that this probably was something private. This leans a bit more into Real Doom.Wad being a map of Columbine High School, as if he had made it publicly available, he may have suspected that law enforcement would catch on to it, thus only choosing it to make it privately shareable with people who were interested in it, and people who would not have suspected it to be anything more than just a Doom level. CNN Doomsday Tape Additional Footage So, if you were as much as an odd kid as I was, you may have had one of those end of the world phases where you get obsessed with the idea and watch every piece of content related to the EAS roleplay, scenario plans, events where the world almost ended, and so on. Or maybe I'm a sociopath, I don't know yet, my therapist won't show me her notes. If you're all familiar with that kind of thing, then you may have heard of the CNN Doomsday Tape. For those who don't know, the CNN Doomsday Tape was a video created at the request of Ted Turner to play in the event of the world comes to an end. Ted Turner had vowed that CNN wouldn't sign off until the end of the world, in which they would cover it to the bitter end, then sign off with this tape. It features a band playing Nearer My God to Thee. Imagine that being the last thing you see and hear before everything ends. It's terrifying. You can come across the video online and it's pretty interesting. The earliest known published account of this tape comes from 1988 from the Cold War, but I should add that the tape was made before the launch of the network in 1980. This is really when nuclear war was a fear across the world, as the Soviet Union and the United States were at odds. But super fun nuclear war fact, 1988 is a significant year for the Cold War, namely due to the signing of the INF Treaty, which limited the use and development of nuclear weapons. If you really scrub hard into the internet, you may still find these discussion boards, but back when I went through that phase of the end of the world, I remember seeing rumors that apparently there was more to the Doomsday Tape than just the band playing. Now, this was back when every Wikia fandom page had their own built-in Wikia chat, so I'm not inclined to believe those rumors. There's also literally no evidence to support these claims. This is just simply conspiracy nuts being conspiracy nuts. If there was ever more to that video, I'm sure it would have come out online shortly after it first leaked. Heck, it's still a rumor though, and I'd honestly just be more of a morbid curiosity to know what else would be on there, but hey. 
Just an urban legend, right? Medieval found footage. This is pretty much a joke entry, but I'll go ahead and explain it anyways. Medieval found footage is a YouTube video that was posted on August 26, 2020. The video is a grainy black and white collection of footage which depicts castles, medieval civilians, and a certain object created in Germany during 1940s. So you can probably guess the group of manufacturers without me saying the word. While I have no idea where the footage at the end of the video comes from, the clips of the actual medieval times comes from a movie called El Valle de las Espadas, a Spanish film from 1963, and I wouldn't even know that if it wasn't for a Reddit user, uh, u slash the jukebox hero, who explained it in a post in r slash ask historians. So there! It's not real! Debunked! Another good day for science. Although the movie does follow a count during the early middle ages, so I guess it's kind of accurate. When I first watched this video, it was really unnerving. It's very clearly a gag, but there's something disturbing about it. The fact that it's quiet and looks and feels like it shouldn't exist in this timeline. The channel that uploaded the video, Basti666, has two other videos in the same style, one of which has more medieval footage. Although this is just a goof, it's definitely a fun thought experiment of time travel and capturing different time periods on camera. Still though, this video is just uncanny valley levels of strange. Tier 5. Useless.avi Normal prawn for normal people, and yes, I'm calling it that, was a creepypasta that follows a narrator's path down a strange and disturbing website of the same name. The author and narrator comes across various strange and disturbing videos on the website, and ultimately comes across the last video titled Useless.avi, which features a very strange-looking primate that has been identified as a shaved chimpanzee and a woman. Now, I'm not sure how you can identify that, but, you know, no questions asked. Now, keep in mind, this wouldn't be the last mention of a primate on this tier. The woman's existence is deleted after the uh, chimpanzee goes full chimp mode and does its thing. By the way, chimps are incredibly scary. You should totally look into the case of Travis the Chimp. Absolutely horrifying. Since it's a creepypasta, there's not much to say about it. Some people actually claim that this video was real at some point, but alleg allegedly it went by a different name. However, there's no sources to that other than the Urban Dictionary page for the term useless.avi. Plus, if it was on the internet under a different name, surely someone would have found it by now. There can't be that many cases of chimps going chimp mode on human beings. Just googled it way bigger than I thought. I, I could spend all day talking about chimp mode statistics and debunking this video, but I really want to talk about some of the other darker stuff on here, so let's get moving. Led Zeppelin Shark Tape. This is just downright disgusting. So sometime in July of 1969, the bands Led Zeppelin and Vanilla Fudge shared a hotel where you can just fish out of the room from your window. And honestly, that kind of hotel sounds great and I need to go immediately. The two bands had been fishing and caught a few sharks and a red snapper. They got a girl and the red snapper together in a closet and... Yeah, I don't think I need to say what happened. I don't want to say what happened. Just please help out your local animal shelter, guys. The whole thing was recorded, too, and has been deemed the shark episode, since some accounts of this claim it was a mud shark, while others claim it was a red snapper. And I'm going to go with red snapper in this story, since that's what was said by the Led Zeppelin's manager who had witnessed it, Richard Cole. Apparently, the video of this incident was handed over to Vanilla Fudge's manager and thus has never seen the light of day. And you know what? That's a good thing. I hope it never does. Next entry. The Grifter. Ah, yes. A yet another classic creepypasta urban legend. This originated on the 4chan paranormal board X, which mentioned a scary video and all that jazz. I won't go too much into this one because it's pretty much your average scary video pasta, but it's always fun to see how far we've come in terms of storytelling on the internet. It follows a video that was posted online that contains horrible, horrible content which either curses the viewer or ends up unaliving them. The imagery associated with the pasta is pretty spooky, and yeah, it still kind of unnerves me for sure, but as for the video itself, it's supposedly only about two minutes of a much larger video, and causes people to lose their faith in the world or go insane or something like that. Viewers whose existence get discontinued are often left with a doll and a note beside it relating to the grifter. I miss the early days of creepypastas, man. For the brief time that this pasta was considered a feasible reality, I wonder what it would have been like to live in that wonderful bliss. Now everybody just disregards it. To play into the fun, there was a creepy video that went along with it. However, it's actually from a Czech film, but oh, the endless fun you can have with this one. LOL Superman. 
A Lost supposed shock video that circulated online, LOL Superman was an alleged video that depicted the ground level of the Twin Towers during the September 11th attacks, in which people jumped from the higher floors of the tower to not succumb to the flames. This video purportedly began to circulate online during 2006 on various shock websites as well as other video sharing platforms. Those who reportedly viewed it claimed that the video was extremely graphic, so the chances of it being uploaded on the YouTube are pretty low, although not impossible, as users have claimed that that's where they first saw the video. But we'll be talking about those possibilities here in a second. The video follows two cameramen in the World Trade Center Plaza as people fall from above. A few cases of the footage has been explored and furthermore debunked as people have tried to look for this video. One video titled NE521 matched all the qualities of the now debunked screenshot and was believed that it was part of LOL Superman. However, the available footage of the video is the only footage of it online, and it's unlikely that there's more to NE521. This video has met a lot of conflicting opinions online, some believing that the video does not exist due to the vague description and other reasons, however many believe that it does exist for the same number of reasons, especially because this isn't something outside of the realm of possibilities for the internet. Russian Microphone Records Hell Man, this urban legend was around when I was young and impressionable online. The Russian microphone records hell rumor started online that apparently when the Russians decided to dig a really deep hole, they ran into intense heat and upon lowering a microphone into the hole, they recorded audio of the souls of the damned begging for help and mercy. This legend bases itself on the Kola Well, the actual deepest hole in the earth, or rather borehole, that was created by the Russians in May of 1970. The Kola Well was closed in 1995, with the borehole reaching depths of 12,262 meters, or 7.6 miles to our non-metric friends. Basically, when the heat got too bad for the Russians to keep digging, they decided to investigate by dropping a microphone, and in some cases of the legend it was a camera into the hole, and hearing a non-stop loud noise, which some interpret to be the souls of the damned scream for mercy. The legend doesn't go too much into what they heard, whether it was just one consistent loud noise like in Dante's Inferno, or if it was many people just begging for help. Anyways, the rumor is basically tied hand in hand with the legend, and that if it was recorded, then a copy of the recording must be out there somewhere. Obviously, just an urban legend from the early days of the internet, but still a lot of fun to speculate nonetheless. Solar Plexus Clown Gliders Virus so, this is funny because I, I can't find any sources to this one. Uh, one day I was doing funny research on the Solar Plexus Clown Gliders image, you know, that horrible thing that's featured on the Conspiracy Theory Iceberg. Yeah, so I was doing research on this and I found this one wiki that talked about it and, you know, I should put it up on the screen if the wiki still exists, but I found this wiki talking about it and basically it said that there was some sort of Trojan virus that would affect computers. In fact, there was like an early email chain that would basically trigger the solar plexus clown gliders thing. Basically, uh, to go over it, uh, there's like certain phrases or images that uh, block your chakra. And so it's basically saying, oh, there was early email chains and uh, Trojan viruses that basically like jump scared and did that. And yeah, it's all just a creepypasta thing and I can't find anything else about it. But, uh, you know, I thought I'd post it on here because it's funny. Uh, there's a blog spot about it, but that that's pretty much it. So, yeah. Three orangutans, one blender. This is a non-existent video that was rumored around early YouTube in 2008. A few YouTubers posted their reactions to the video, however, all of them are fake. Pretty good acting for its time, though. It was allegedly so bad, though, that the video had profound psychological effects on people who viewed it. The video allegedly takes place in a jungle camp where men take a bunch of orangutans and things get kind of brutal. I don't think I need to describe in detail what happens, but the number of orangutans significantly decreases. Then they're all thrown into this big blender-like machine and the number of orangutans decreases again. Then the remaining orangutans are introduced to tigers and the number decreases. The video was allegedly only a clip of a bigger video, somewhere around three hours long, featuring an unknown organization doing this to specifically orangutans. This was one of those big kind of screamer videos that floated around back then, you know, where something is really nice and then it suddenly cuts to a bunch of orangutans and a big old mechanism. Ah, the early internet. You've got to really wonder, how do people come up with this kind of stuff? And where are they now? Oh, and contrary to that title, there were in fact more than just three orangutans. So, you know, I thought I'd just put that out there. Today was a sunny day broadcast. 
In 1968, the Tlatelolco Massacre, or the Mexican Student Movement, took the lives of hundreds of people who were protesting the 1968 Summer Olympics. This took place after Mexican law enforcement opened fire on protesters in the Plaza de las Tres Culturas in Mexico City. And man, my Spanish is horrible. There's a lot of factors that went into this event, many of which I can't talk about here on YouTube. Plus, this is about lost media, so let's talk about that. Jacobo Zabludovsky was a Mexican journalist who covered the event on his newscast shortly after the massacre. Many people remember him saying the phrase, Hoy fue un día soleado, meaning today was a sunny day in English. And I really probably butchered that, but yeah. In what many remember to be downplaying the event. There have been all sorts of debates over which broadcast this was set on, which channel it played on, and if he even said it to begin with, as he never confirmed if he did or didn't say it. Many people remember him saying it, many remember it being a different reporter. Either way, there's a collective memory that remembers this broadcast and this phrase being uttered on television. Many consider this to be a Mandela effect, however, since there's no broadcast to be found, it can't be proven or disproven if it truly exists, thus making the Today Was a Sunny Day broadcast a lost media urban legend.